My name is Kenneth Brenner. I was born October 12, 1920, in Lynn, Massachusetts. This interview is being conducted July 1, 2004, the Atlanta History Center. The interviewer is Robert Gardner. His daughter, Marcia Brenner Cruz, is also in attendance. Mr. Brenner, what war or wars did you serve in? I war, served in World War II in the Navy. Uh, I joined July 20th, 1942. Uh, I am the product of two immigrants. My dad came to this country as an infant back in 1895. My mother came here in 1912 as a 12-year-old girl. I have graduated Lynn Classical High School in 1939 during the Depression. And unfortunately at that time, there was, it was the height of a depression. It was very difficult to get a job. And I wanted to join the Navy, but my mother wouldn't let me because I was only 18 years old. In 1942, when the war broke out, 1941, I joined the Navy in, at July and sent to uh, the training station in Newport, Rhode Island at Connington Point. On arriving there, we slept in hammocks, which I never slept in again, but they are the most comfortable hammock that you ever want to sleep in. They were warm, they wrapped around you, and it was really we looked forward to actually <laughs> going to bed at night, but we didn't have these bunks. Uh, the first week I was there, unfortunately, like we all did, we all got KP. The second week, well, actually of that same week, we got our injections and what do I, what did I do? But I picked up a four to, a 12, four to six in the morning security guard with a temperature, God knows how sick I was at that time. So it was a very uncomfortable feeling and I said, what am I doing here? But after training, there was no problem and we were shipped out. I was shipped to the fleet school as part of ship's company in Norfolk, Virginia, which was at NOB, Naval Operating Base. I served there as a apprentice seaman for six months and then was draft, put in a draft to board the USS Boise, which was in Philadelphia being outfitted after being in an engagement in the Solomons and having taken a tremendous hit in the, through the number two turret, which disabled her and she was brought back to Philadelphia to be refurbished. On boarding her, we found that we were, I was assigned to the fire control division as an apprentice seaman, or seaman second class. Uh, I have the diary here that I had kept from the time I boarded her. And on July 8th, 1942, June 8th, 1942, from, we left Norfolk, Virginia after a shakedown cruise in the Chesapeake Bay. On the 19th, without even with which was 11 days later, we found ourselves going through the Straits of Gibraltar to North Africa. We ended up in Oran at Mirz el Kabir on the 20th of June, then on to Algiers the 21st. Then from the 21st to the 28th, we did maneuvers in the Mediterranean in preparation for what nobody knew. On July 7th, we left Algiers, and on the 8th we were off Pantelleria. On the 9th we were off Lampedusa and, and uh, British Malta. On the 10th we were at, in the, during, in the, we were at the invasion of Sicily, and 
the invasion took place at a city called, town called Gala, or Jela. Uh, I have some photographs here that are, uh, were taken by a, uh, a photographer from the Life magazine. His name was Ayerman. And this would give you an idea of just what of what had happened at during the invasion. The one incident that was very important to me and to all of us aboard ship was the fact that we had spotters on the beach. And the afternoon of the invasion, which started at daybreak, we got the word that a panzer division was heading for the beach. And we are ordered to fire on these panzers and so that they would not push our troops back. And uh, we set, set up salvos being spotted by the spotters on the beach that told us that we had driven them back, which saved our troops from being driven back into the waters, which was very, very exhilarating as far as we were concerned. On the 14th, we left Sicily and we we're back to Algiers to take on ammo and supplies. In the course of taking on the ammo from a barge, we were, parked, we were anchored out in the harbor. A ship blew up in the harbor itself, caused by swimmers that were more or less uh, partisan to the Germans. And I remember carrying a five-inch shell on my shoulder from the barge to the, where we were going to put it below decks. And I ended up under one of the turrets, <laughs> which wasn't funny at the time. Uh, uh, let's see. Then we left for Bizzurdi in North Africa. And in Bizzurdi, we received, we got there on the 23rd. On the 24th, we were back to Algiers. Why we went to Bizzurdi, I don't know. On August 4th, a ship in the harbor exploded. Another one. On the, 11th, we left, on the 8th, we left for Palermo, Sicily. On the 9th, in Palermo Harbor, we experienced the water is so calm in the harbor that it's like a sheet of ice. And I remember on morning exercises, when we were doing the jumping jack, we created waves that they didn't know they were going to get ashore. Plus the ship bobbed in and out of the water, just like a cork bobbing in the water, which we thought was, was hysterical at the time. You know, a little, a little humor always went a long way where we actually uh, <laughs> were more or less so morbid all the time with the daily routine. Uh, <clears throat> uh, let's see, on August 4th in Palermo Harbor. On the 12th of August, we, at midnight, this is when the American troops were forcing the Germans back along the northern coast of Sicily to the Messina Straits, to the Po of, Italy, the toe of Italy. And we were, our orders were to bombard the roads to delay the, the uh, which was mountainous roads, to delay the German troops from evacuating Sicily. Uh, at that, at midnight, we bombarded along the, along the coast of northern Sicily. And then we went into or the Cape Orlando and Cape Calabria and bombed the, bombarded the, the harbor where the German troops were evacuating from Sicily. When we returned to, we returned to Palermo that afternoon. On the 14th, back to Cape Orlando and Cape Calabria. We patrolled, on the, we patrolled the area, and on the way back to Palermo, 
On the coastal road in Sicily, which is a mountain, as I said before, road, a German 88 came out of a tunnel and shelled us. We at that turn changed from regular uh, shells to penetrating shells. And we closed the tunnel up in order to save ourselves to begin with. We did get some hits, not on the ship itself, but shot of the ship, which actually gave us, uh, I remember being on, on the range finder, I was a fire controlman, and my position, GQ position, was in number four turret on a range finder. And on the phones, from the after control, uh, on, on the uh, bridge control, in a slot, a lookout slot from the where one of our fire, fire controlmen was, was maybe six inches by 12 inches where a sh piece of shrapnel penetrated and hit one of our men in the shoulder. And it was an eerie feeling to hear I'm hit, I'm hit over the phones because all our phones were connected from the after, con after control to the turrets, uh, gun turrets. Uh, on the 14th, we heard that afternoon, on the 17th, we heard that Sicily had fallen, much to our elation. On the 18th, we bombarded Palmi, Italy, at midnight. We did all our shelling <laughs> at midnight, it seemed, and it was quite a sight to see the explosions on the shore. Is that what's in the, the magazine? Yeah. Do you want to show the magazine? No, that, that's all Sicily in the magazine. On the 18th, we left Palermo for Algiers. Uh, and on our way to Algiers, uh, we were attacked by aircraft off the coast of Bizerti. On the 19th, we were in Algiers. On the 24th, we were, then we went between the 19th and the 24th and the 31st. We were, every day we were out on maneuvers. Uh, then my diary stopped at that particular time, and we were on our way. We picked up troops in Algiers, British troops, not knowing what we were going to do because we were not a transport ship for troops. And instead of going up into the for the invasion at at uh, Salerno. We took these troops into Toronto, which is in the heel of the boot of Italy, and put them ashore to travel up the east coast of Italy while the troops, our American troops, were being put ashore at Salerno Bay. On our way back to Algiers from there, uh, I was on the bridge as a telephone talker from the gunnery officer to the secondary 525 inch batteries. Uh, my lieutenant who was in charge by the name of Howell, Lieutenant Howell, came on the tech, came on the bridge and uh, said to me, Brenner, I have your replacement here. Give him your phones. And I looked at him amazed. I said, what are you taking the phones away from me for? He says, you're going to school. I said, are you kidding? He says, no. There's a draft of two fire controlmen, one fire controlman, a draft from the radar di division, from the, from the gunnery division, from the, uh, there was maybe 12 of us from each division aboard ship going back to, uh, to Norfolk, Virginia to go to school. Back to the school where I had been as ship's, ship's company for six months on my, the first six of my six months of my service. Well, then it was a hassle from there. We were put off in Algiers, and from there we were 
put on a disabled LST with a with a bad rudder, and we traveled from Algiers all the way to Oran, which took about ten days. Where normally we did it in one day with the cruise. From there we were put into a tent city, and I know a lot of sailors and a lot of soldiers know about living in a tent city, which to me was not very pleasant. We were then put on a train, box cars, with open slats, cattle cars. And for three days we traveled back to Oran, which from Missouri, not Missouri, from we went to Oran from Oran, I'll, I'll say from Algiers to Oran, by LST, from Oran, from, uh, from Oran, let's see, I'm, I'm now getting my stories mixed up here. Well, anyway, we were put on uh, boxcars, and it rained, it, it was cold, the nights were very, very cold. This was, I believe, in July, August, September. And the nights in North Africa are beastly cold. The next morning, we pulled into a train station and we saw a wagon full of hay, bales of hay. We made a dash for the bales of hay, threw them on the boxcars for a bed to sleep on. That night, it rained. Talk about smelling like we were cattle. We were cattle. <laughs> and then when we got back to Oran, let's see, yeah, from Azel Kabir to Oran, or wherever, and I'm trying to, getting my cities mixed up, uh, we were put on a British ship to go back to the States. Getting back to the States, I spent another three, four months at the school. At that time, I became a fire controlman first class. And unfortunately, I was supposed to have been shipped back to the Boise. But being in Atlantic Command, the Boise was sent back to the Pacific. And they were not going to send me out to the Pacific, where they were now under the Pacific Command. So they assigned me to a ship, a fleet tanker, which call, was called the USS Mattapony. Uh, now, as most sailors will know, in those days, cap, uh, capital ships like battleships were named after states. Cruisers were named after cities, capital cities. Light cruisers, capital cities. Submarines were named after fish. Destroyers are named after personnel. The Mattapanai was named after an Indian tribe called the Mattapo the uh, uh, Mattaponi Indian, which is the Indian tribe of north of Boston, which is north of south of Lynn, south of Boston, where Lynn was north of Boston of the Mattapan, town of Mattapan. Mattapan, Mattaponi. Mattaponi, I called it, at that time. Ironically. And I spent the next year and a half on the Mattaponi, taking, being in convoys, troop convoys, um, Liberty ship convoys of six knots, which took 30 days to go across, across the ocean. We must have made 20 trips, refueling the destroyer escorts and the destroyers for these convoys. By early daybreak, before daybreak, we'd be sitting in the middle of a convoy, and we would pull back out of the convoy, behind the convoy, and at daybreak, each one on each important starboard, two 
to escort ships would come alongside to be refueled. And at that time, I was a point, I was a fire, I became a fire controlman second class. And I was in charge of the shot line gun from the bridge to the, from captain to captain for the, during refueling. Uh, we had quite a few breaks of hoses at times when, when ships would pop away from us and just extend out. And the poor ship, poor sailors aboard would get drenched with seawater plus the oil before they could cut the uh, lines. At that time, we had a doctor aboard ship. He was a sweetheart. He would call everybody up and give them a shot of liquor when that happened. Nobody had to, the only ones that had booze aboard ship were the, some of the officers. And he always had a little bit of alcohol around and, and I'd get a night. Even though I was forward of the bridge and they were after the bridge at the well decks, I would go in and get my little nip. <laughs> uh, when we hit the last time I was on the Mattapanai, I got orders to go to school, to the fleet school in Washington, D.C., which was uh, uh, in Anacostia. And while I was there, Hiroshima got hit. At that time, I had married my wife, my girlfriend, which my daughter is a, and her brother is a product of, and we was, we went to Washington, and we lived in Washington for two months, and during that time, we were being prepared to train to be fire controlmen on LSRs for the invasion of Japan, and LSRs were no fun because being a fire controller would be controlling the fire and we'd only be laid off the shore of about a mile, 2,000 or 3,000 yards offshore. And we weren't looking forward to it. Fortunately, Hiroshima became a, the end of the war, actually. And when I returned home, uh, I did not go to school, but my um, two uncles of mine were in the auto upholstery business which I took advantage of with the GI. No, I didn't take advantage of because I took advantage of that to buy my first home. I was, I'm just trying to think, and it's so long ago, so almost 60 years ago, that uh, it's, oh, instead of the 6220, 5220 that was at that time, we got $20 a week, a month, or a week for 62, 52 weeks. I went to work as an apprentice from, from my two uncles who taught me the trade of being an auto upholsterer, convertible tops and seat covers and replacing upholstery in automobiles. Then I went into business for myself and uh, Now, getting back, I don't remember if I had, yeah, well, actually, let me see what I have here. But they have pictures, you have pictures already of all of this. Let me see. Um, they have pictures of He wants to include this in the yeah. video, so if they don't have the picture, show them. Oh, don't you have the picture? Well, he's got, he... yeah, he's, oh. No. Now, uh, what I would like to do is actually show you the two ships that it was on. And this is a picture of the cruise of the Boise, which I'm very proud to have served on during the invasion of Sicily. Now, this is a picture of the Mattapanai. And if you'll notice, there are PT boats 
on the well decks of the ship that we had transported over to North Africa in one of our convoys. Okay. Now, at the fleet school, this is a group picture of my class. And if you'll notice, I am in the second row, third in, third from the, as you look at the picture, from the right, which you probably won't even recognize. I look like a little 12-year-old kid in it. I, in fact, at the age of 22 there, I did look like a 14-year-old little guy. <laughs> Okay, now, these are pictures that were taken by the airmen, by J.R. Airmen, showing about showing the invasion of Italy. And this is the starboard side of the 5-inch 25s in action. That's the top picture. And on the bottom shows shells bursting. Did you get that? Shells bursting on the shore. Was that Life magazine? This is still out of the Life magazine. This is the night action. Can you get the whole picture in on that? This is the night action showing the traces of the bombing and invasion of at the time of the, of the troops approaching the beach. Is that Sicily? Yeah. Now, the, here are a few more with the Nazi planes attacking the troop ships. And also the burst off our starboard side of shell hitting the water, aircraft shells or bombs. Now on this page, I am going to show you a picture of a troop transport with the troops leaving the ship. And the second photo down is of an LCT coming alongside our ship with wounded. And then on the bottom of the page is a picture of our captain inspecting us uh, after the action when we get back to uh, North Africa. And I have a little story to say about the one with the LST. It's a quite, quite a coincidental type of story. Coincidence where a friend of mine who I went out with on double dating, who I had met my wife through, is a motor mechanic on that LCT. The, his name is Sidney Grubb, graduated the same year as I did in high school. At the age of 18, he was bald, which he had more hair on his body than he had on his head, which is very common, I imagine. Where I'm, I don't have much hair on my body, but I do have it on my head. He came alongside with two German badly wounded men, 
two Americans. We had a, aboard the cruiser, we had a operating room with a full client, full staff of physicians. They were brought ashore because they could not be treated at, aboard, at, on the shore at that time. I don't know if I'm one of the sailors looking over the side of the ship at that time onto the LS, LCT. But I spotted this little ball-headed guy who didn't have his sea cap on. And I said, that could be Sid. And I yelled down to the LCT and I said, Sid Grubb? And he looked up and it was Sid Grubb. And where were you? I was on the ship. No, where in the world were this you? Was, this was uh, at Sicily. At Sicily. This is D-Day plus two. Where he had put troops with his LCT on the, on the beach. He came ashore, I came aboard, and we had a conversation for about a half an hour before he had to get back ashore. Or back to his ship. His L, his. Uh, a supply ship, a troop ship. When I, now that we have all the pictures here, not all, this by the way is the diary that I kept, which is, this is a two-sided of the daily routine of the ship, uh, port to port to where. Okay. Now, as far as Sid Grubb is concerned, when I got put ashore, I put ashore, I guess it, I said Algiers, but I think it was Bizerti, North Africa. Who do I run into but Sid Grubb again? And now this is two months later a month and a half later, after the Sicilian invasion. And he told me he was being shipped to England. And when he got to England, he was supposed to do the same thing for Normandy as he did Sicily. But fortunately for him, he got sent on the V-12 program back to the States to MIT to go to school, which was a great program. He graduated as a uh, electrical engineer, no, um, a uh, industrial engineer. And I'd, since then, I've only seen him maybe uh, two or three times. Uh, in fact, we lost contact, and I've lost contact with a great many of uh, my friends. In fact, there was one man in particular when I was ship's company at NOB, who was a uh, machinist, a motor machinist on the uh, Yorktown, on the, not the Yorktown, the, uh, yeah, it was the Yorktown they could, that they lost in the Pacific. And he was, his name was Sid Flum. And uh, he was badly burnt at that time, but he was one of the fortunates that did get off of the ship. And uh, he was assigned as an instructor in the, in the, on the, uh, at the school, on the uh, machinist mate school that we had at NOB at the fleet school. And I became very friendly with him. And every time we got back, which my home port was Norfolk, Virginia, uh, I ended up seeing him at the school. And then he had married and uh, he had a, had a son. And they were living at Ben Morrell, which was a housing at the, where the fleet school was, there was a housing project called Ben Morrell, where he in turn had lived with his family and still taught at the fleet school. Um, a little over a year ago, no, no, uh, six years ago, when my grandson, oh, by the way, I have two grand, my son has given me two grandchildren. And I'm not going into detail as to what their education, how brilliant they are, which I'm very proud of. <laughs> uh, 
my grandson, when he graduated when he was married in Virginia, uh, my son took us over to NOB, which I was very impressed, not impressed, but I was really amazed the way that has grown when from the time I was there in Norfolk, Virginia. And the, we went by the Ben Morrell area, and I, I just unbelievable where the, the, the Norfolk base, which was where the air base is, was, and the fleet piers has now extended almost all the way into Norfolk, Virginia, into the town, where it was nothing but a, a uh, empty space in which we, the only way we get in the town was by streetcar. And uh, it, it just, I'd love to get in touch with this Sid Flum again if I possibly could. Uh, and I have a picture at home that I bring in where when I was on the Mattapanai uh, of a, another shipmate I was very friendly with where I was, where we went on, she went ashore uh, like in Aruba, which was a very an oil island at that time where we took on oil, uh, was just like I'd say here in like Stone Mountain downtown with oil derricks. And he and I were being on shore patrol, had a picture of us taken with the belt, the leggings, the whole bit, which I treasure, and he's another one that if I, I can't remember his name, if I can ever find out if he's still living, I'd love to agree, meet up with him again. Just amazing. Uh, now I am retired. Uh, after being in business in a, in, as an auto, auto uh, upholsterer, uh, I ended up in a city called Lawrence, Massachusetts working for a uh, manufacturer of men's clothing. And in the last 40 years, I learned the trade, had my own custom-made, custom-made to measure business of making men's clothing. At the age of 80, when my, when my mother, God bless her, died at the age of 101, left us. My daughter, who is now here in Atlanta for 26 years, said to me, Dad, do you want to stay up in that cold country up there? Come on down and live here in Atlanta and live without the snow, the sleet, and everything that goes with New England. And I said, well, I'll think about it. Two days later, I had a lock in the door of my business, told my son to take over the building, run the building that I owned, or the bank owns. <laughs> my daughter came up. We sold everything but my bedroom set and a dining room set. Refurbished the home down here, and I'm extremely happy after three years of being in Atlanta. And I say to everybody, come to Atlanta. It's Great, <laughs> and let's say let's have let's say what happens now, uh, and just getting now back to my my dad was with the 26th Infantry. And World War One. This is World War One, and this is what he received on his discharge, explaining, which I believe is being knighted, and on the bottom it says Benjamin Brenner, Private First Class, 26th Infantry. And where was he in the world? In his military. And he fought, and his, his first wounds were received at a battle at St. Mihill. 
Then when he went back to his unit. Where is St. Mihal? In French. And when he went back to his unit, he was wounded again. And unfortunately, his wounds, here are his medals and his identification plate. And that's, you'll see the Purple Heart with an oak leaf cluster having been wounded twice. And unfortunately, he suffered with one of his wounds for the rest of his life where he died at 60, 64 years of age uh, from a wound in the leg that before penicillin, penicillin became phlebitic, which is a swelling of the calf, which until, as I remember as a youngster, until penicillin was uh, discovered, he would be in the Army or Navy hospitals once a year to have uh, treatments where it would ulcerate on him. And uh, because of that particular wound, he had problems walking uh, to a point where he would stand the same, he would stand up like a stalk to take the pressure off the bad leg. And uh, Tell us about his military service. Well, he went in the service and he went to New York and he joined the Army in New York and was shipped, uh, went after his basic training, uh, he was shipped to the Mexican border when do you think all at this Rio was? Grande. When do you think he went into the military? What year? Oh, he went in about 1916. 1915, 1916, and in 1917 he was in France till 1918. And uh, when he came out, he met my mother. Uh, when he came home to Lynn, uh, where he was one of seven children, he was the baby, so to speak. And he came home to Lynn because he wanted to. He told me a few times that he would have liked to stay in stayed in New York. But he came home because of his mother. And uh, he met my mother uh, while he was visiting when he came back. And uh, my mother and he were met at a what they call a fireman's ball in those days, when there were popular policemen's balls, firemen's ball. And he immediately took a liking to her, and he asked her to marry him. And unfortunately, my grandfather was very orthodox, very orthodox Jewish man, where my father was a wounded veteran and not didn't keep the, the faith, so to speak, because he ate uh, non-kosher foods. Said, he's not for you. And my father's oldest brother went and spoke to him and explained to him what the situation was. And he finally agreed that they could get married. Where else was he stationed in the world besides France? Just in France. I thought he was in Mexico. And that's where he was, no, Texas, on the Mexican border, okay. heading on the Rio Grande, which I just said. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. my. Brother, by the way, might as well get throw him in. Was with the a Black Panther division. He was drafted when he got his uh, training in Camp Landing, Florida, and was part of what the uh, division called the Black Panther division. Now yeah, they were sent to England, and when the troops were out the when the Germans countered counterattacked at the Bulge. They were slated to go in to relieve the, to reinforce the troops at the box. And there was, his ship was delayed in English, in the English harbor. And they didn't really, didn't know why, because of part of the crew, uh, 600 of his troops, of his division, shipped out the day before. And they were torpedoed crossing the channel. And they lost over 600 men on that crossing, and that's why his ship was delayed. So instead of them going into relieving or reinforcing his division, reinforcing the bulge, they were sent to St. Nazaire 
Zoom, which was a pocket where the German submarine pits were, uh, German submarine uh, units were, to contain the German troops into that circle that they, uh, they held them to. And uh, what can I say? Like my mother used to say, Leah, what have you got to say? She'd say, what can I say? <laughs> and God bless her, she lived to 101. And she was a sweetheart. Thank you, Ma. Well, I want, to th <clears throat> I want to thank you for doing this interview with us. It's definitely been my pleasure. And I really appreciate you taking the time to come here and do this for us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much, sir.